Well, I am really delighted to introduce our keynote speaker, Rob Sampson. Rob is the Henry Ford II Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University, where he has his hands in many different uh, research uh, enterprises. He's the director of the Boston Area Research Initiative. He's overseeing the social sciences project at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and um, he's someone who has, both in terms of his scholarship and his administrative ability, exercised a lot of leadership um, over his um, remarkable career. Uh, he was chair of the, Depart of the Department of Sociology and taught at the University of Chicago for 12 years before moving to Harvard in 2003. Uh, he's also taught at the University of Illinois, and he's been a senior research fellow at the American Bar Foundation. Rob's research and teaching cover a variety of areas, including crime, disorder, the life course, neighborhood effects, civic engagement, inequality, ecometrics, and the social structure of the city. I need to introduce you to the dozens of articles, I'd say, uh, the lion's share of them really feel defining um, that he's written uh, over the past uh, quarter century or so. Um, he's also author of several books. Um, uh, he, broke out in many respects, um, uh, doing a longitudinal and field-defining study of uh, crime and delinquency in 1993, co-authoring with John Lau, Crime in the Making, Pathways and Turning Points Through Life, and a follow-up study published 10 years later called Shared Beginnings, Divergent Lives, Delinquent Boys to Age 70, um, both of which are really extraordinary um, pieces of social scientific scholarship. Um, and uh, just as he established a, a formidable reputation as a scholar of, of crime and the life course, um, Rob embarked on a project called the Project on Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods. This was a project that began, um, I won't say modestly, because really nothing that Rob has ever been in, involved in as a scholar is modest, it's big picture, it's ambitious, it's exciting, but it began rather more modestly than the book that came out as a, as a kind of an expansion um, through a uh, study of Chicago of many of the issues about crime and delinquency that he had been studying um, earlier in his career, and instead it really turned into really one of the most important path-breaking books in sociology, uh, and especially in urban sociology, in the last uh, quarter century or even longer. Um, and this is uh, was published in 2012 as Great American City, Chicago, and the Enduring Neighborhood Effect. This is a book that demonstrates um, both what I would call methodological diversity, that is, uh, uh, Rob and, and the team that he worked with on this are not simply relying on one uh, approach, um, they're qualitative and quantitative. Uh, they relied on observation teams of, of researchers drove around Chicago with cameras uh, uh, filming uh, street life in Chicago. Others uh, mailed letters to the post boxes in an experiment. Uh, still, uh, Rob and, and his colleagues gathered an immense amount of data about Chicago neighborhoods. Um, and the result is a real, uh, a real tour de force um, that sheds light on such important subjects as neighborhood effects or the impact of where you live on your life opportunities and outcomes, as well as collective efficacy and civic life. So, uh, as someone who has written extensively about Chicago, Rob has also grappled with the question of immigration. And some of the passages in Great American City, some of the sections that deal with the impact of immigration on Chicago neighborhoods, um, are some of the most interesting, which is one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I will be invited to uh, to come and address us this afternoon. So, with no further ado, I will turn the podium over to Rob Samson uh, and welcome him here. Thank you, Tom, for that very kind introductions. Uh, delight uh, to be here today and interesting conversations already. And, uh, pleased to talk on immigration and the new social transformation of the American city. A mysterious thing happened on the way to the widely projected meltdown of American cities in the last quarter of the 20th century. Instead of collapse, many of our largest and hardest hit cities embarked on a 180 degree turn, confounding their critics and social scientists alike. Why did these cities grow and rebound, witnessing renaissance rather than ruin? Or, to paraphrase the pen historian, Michael Katz, why didn't American cities burn? 
More broadly, what counts for the remarkable crime declines of recent years in the U.S. and the return of urban vibrancy? So in this paper talk, I make the case for immigration as one answer, although certainly not the only factor. I argue that the evidence merits, including immigration, alongside other, more dominant hypotheses for the nation's crime decline and its urban revitalization. I do so by reviewing the logic for why immigration is a compelling hypothesis, explicating social mechanisms to account for the changes we have observed, and considering new empirical evidence. So I'm going to kind of give you an overview of sort of what's happened in cities, what are some of the reasons, some of my own research, and then end with some new empirical research, kind of a broad overview of the work of others and, and myself on these questions. It's important to begin, however, not with the present, but with the urban trajectory of the last quarter century as it unfolded. Now, I know Thomas Grew, historian, but um, as a sociologist who <coughs> deep interest in history, I, I always worry about retrospective versus prospective. And I think it's important to really uh, start with where cities were, or at least the conception of them, in the 70s. Having lived through it myself, I've been wrestling with this a lot. Circle the 19, no, mid 70s. Pundits of all stripes were captivated by the undeniable crises of our central cities, whether because of the scars of 1960s rioting, population outmigration, job losses, high crime, fiscal collapse, racial inequality, or widespread housing vacancies. Cities were thought to be dying, especially older cities in the East and Midwest, Rust Belt. Now, although the causal origins of the urban crisis had deep roots stretching back decades, things seemed to come to a symbolic head when President Gerald Ford allegedly told New York City to drop dead rather than expect a federal bailout, according to the famous headline in the New York Post in 1975. And New York was sort of the epicenter in a way. Um, I lived in New York actually right at that time after uh, skipping year in my undergraduate years living in New York. Um, 75, 76, and 77. And, um, what's really about the city is roller coaster. This is what it's about, right? And this is on sort of the down, downward spin as you've gone up in the despair era. And I love this picture. Because this, who lived in New York in the 1970s? Yeah, okay, this is it. I mean, I live at 125th and uh, Broadway. Um, just take the number one train, which actually looks worse than this. And I love the picture because of the quiet determination here, almost the defiance of this man, the cop, the dog. It's just, it captures it all. It was actually more graffiti. And, and this was the scene. And that's the headline. And in a way, this captured the image projected outward what New York was like, but also inward, the South Bronx is a famous uh, statement that the Bronx is burning, which we will get to figure out allegedly Howard Cosell said this during the Yankees game, but I don't think that's ever been actually <clears throat> determined. Now, the tailspin of decline continued into the 80s, and there's an intellectual framework here too. James Q. Wilson and George Kelly in 1982 captured the zeitgeist of angst with their treatise on urban disorder and broken windows. Huge impact. While William Julius Wilson's The Truly Disadvantaged, published in 1987, brought the social transformation and unraveling of the inner city to public attention. Although the debate was largely about industrial cities, especially Billboard, the South and West were not immune. Miami, for example, suffered one of the nation's worst race riots since the 1960s, the beginning of the 80s. In Los Angeles, which by the mid-80s had been the nation's second largest city, was the site of racial tension and the subject of apocalyptic predictions before the eruption of the Rodney King riots. Mike Davis got some things wrong. He, he, uh, it was an interesting uh, set of writings on Los Angeles at the time. At the end of the 1980s, the crack cocaine epidemic put what seemed to be the final nail on the city coffin. Violence spiraled again and hit its peak in 1990 in New York City topping out at over 2,300 murders, 2, 3, 4, 5, I believe is the exact figure, in 1990, the highest since records have been kept. Having lived again in New York City during the mid-70s, during the summer of Sam, and then again for three years in the early 80s, in the 
Bernard Getz era, for those of you who remember that, and who became a folk hero of sorts by shooting uh, four men on the subway who thought we'd like to rob them. And then having moved to the University of Chicago in 1991, just when homicides were hitting the peak, century, 20 centuries high there, I thought, um, you know, this is it, cities are done. Um, witnessing the urban decay of the 1970s and 80s. But then the world changed. Rather than the predicted or seemingly inevitable collapse, violence suddenly began to plummet, and formerly hemorrhaging cities began to grow. Today, some of the basket cases of the decline are the envy of the suburbs, turning tables on the experts. Analogous to the fall of the Soviet Union and the Great Recession, experts were caught off guard and failed to predict major social change. So as a criminologist, I don't feel bad. It's both the science and economics screwed it up, too. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we can't explain that play, right? <laughs> By the way, we, we never really could explain the increase in the 60s. <laughs> My theory on that is it's asymmetric. But that's not the story. Um, the magnitude of the turnaround and the scope of urban renaissance are worth noting. Last year, for example, 2013, New York walked fewer than 350 murders in a city that was larger than it was in 1990. The lowest count was its empirical records that we kept. Violence in Los Angeles declined markedly as well, over 75%, as it did all over the country. Thus, rather than the arrival of the violent super predators, which you may recall were widely uh, trumpeted, uh, violence began uh, to fall. And again, it's, it's quite remarkable. So, um, just do a little, a little bit of math. Um, it's not just New York. You just take it out, like from the 1992 homicide rate. Do counterfactual, something like 100,000 people are alive that would not have been otherwise. That's pretty good to remain stable. Um, Mm -hmm. And this is also an interesting point, which I hadn't quite grasped. You go back to Bill Wilson's book, on, which I think of as sort of the first social transformation in the 70s and 80s, on the underclass, quote, dislocations, is the phrase he used. The increases in the concentration of poverty and the other social bills at the time were actually of a smaller magnitude than the magnitude of the improvement, at least with regard to crime, right? I mean, 85% decline in New York, 75% decline. Bill was talking on the order of 50% increases for a lot of the phenomena. So that's important that this uh, really uh, magnitude is, is tremendous. Chicago, even there. And for all groups, this is important too, because I've heard the claim that says, well, the highest crime neighborhoods or African American neighborhoods did not um, see an improvement, which is not correct. Um, all groups saw a decline. So, for example, this is the uh, African American decline over so about 750 down to um, now it's under 300. Um, so, it's benefiting everywhere. In fact, recent work with Matt Sharp shows that the decline in the violence rate, um, it even extended now past uh, 2005 to 2013. The rate of decline is greater in, in the uh, black community. So um, again, tremendous changes. And this is what it looks like. Um, leave the beaver alone. I guess you have to be a certain age to date <laughs> myself here. Um, it's an inverted U, basically, is what's happening. This is a national picture, so again, the New York uh, peak is slightly different amount of time. But the point is, even though polls don't, you know, people don't believe it, where we are now, is back not only to the early 60s, we're actually back into the 50s in terms of um, crime. So the tranquil you know, 50s and all that's where we're at. And it's not just crime that has pivoted. Today, the Big Apple is, I think, as thriving, as exciting as ever, as are places such as Los Angeles, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco. Even Chicago and Miami appear back from the brink. These and other central cities are magnets not just for the young, but empty nesters and families with children. Construction cranes are everywhere, it seems, in the race to meet demand for city living. Suburbs are kind of passe in many places, to the shock of many politicians and developers. Um, it's more. Teenage pregnancy is down, infant mortality. Um, it, it's, a, it's really a, a wide variety of uh, phenomena. This is important. Other dimensions of social change. Again, people don't believe this, but uh, teenage pregnancies down. 
more so for blacks and whites, arrests are down more so for blacks and whites, and shocking um, statistic perhaps in a great article, I need to update this by Sam Preston, university right here, on uh, the anatomy of a, what do you call it, uh, not even use miracles, <laughs> scientists for that, but um, New York's turnaround on life expectancy increases in New York, attributed um, in part to immigration. A 6.6 .6 year increase in life expectancy for black males, 3.7 for white males, that differential to large part to the violence. So, I mean, lots of different data, the story's the same. Um, to be sure, the urban renaissance did not unfold evenly. That on the table right now. While creativity, diversity, lower crime, and energy define cities on the move, inequality is ever present. Detroit's not the only city that still struggles with violence or that has hemorrhaged people and jobs. Divergent trajectories of place are the norm. St. Louis continues to struggle, for example, and smaller cities like Stockton, California, are the face of today's new fiscal crisis. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is talk about the social transformation a bit at a broad level and then dig down um, some details. So what explains this? Both the winners and the losers. There is no one answer, of course. As rarely is there a single cause of any complex social phenomenon. It doesn't stop people from trying lots of magic bullets. But there is virtue intellectually, I think, in systematically exploring how far can you go with a clear-cut idea. Now, I just want to go back now again, just Historically, so about, well, 2005, 2006, there was a swirling debate about the great American crime decline. A book had come out by Bloomstein and Wallman on the great American crime decline, and there was this debate going on. And I sort of thought it was an interesting debate. And at the time, law enforcement officials, politicians, and social scientists had put forward many explanations for the mysterious and large crime drop in America. And um, lots of lots of talk, and these are the main suspects, right? Lots of policing. So it's Giuliani, it's Corbyn, those policing. Now it's locking people up. Now it's the economy that clearly didn't work. Mm -hmm. um, crack cocaine, secession. <clears throat> Steve Levitt, abortion theory. These, these all made headlines. Um, aging of the baby boomers. And I was puzzled about this um, because what had been left off the table seemed notable, and that's immigration. It seemed odd because the transformed vitality of cities was most visible in places that had seen the greatest increases in immigration, at least from an observational point. And as noted earlier, New York, a leading magnet for immigration, had for decades ranked as uh, one of America's safest cities, and of course we just saw this great decline and a boom. Crime in Los Angeles dropped considerably in the late 90s, over 50% just in the 90s, and as I showed you, 75% continue. Border cities like San Jose, um, low crime rates, places like uh, Phoenix, uh, even Dallas, and other places that large immigrant flows, drops in crime. And of course, the magnitude of the change in immigration was big, not trivial, 50% in the 90s alone. The United States has become increasingly diverse ethnically, <coughs> And not just in our nation's cities, but suburban and rural areas, as we had the discussion about national. And this was important, it seems to me, because a lot of these arguments, like policing, well, we, we've got a great police force in New York. Well, you might, but LA had a shitty police force <laughs> and did nothing, and their crime rate went down. Can you really explain this massive phenomenon with a local explanation? It seemed like you needed a broad one, and by the way, crimes down in Canada. And if you draw the lines, it's exactly parallel. Toronto is a 40-year low, and they also saw a great immigration. So you start to think there's got to be something a little bit bigger than a local um, scene. So based on these changes, but rooted in the long line of criminological research, not new, I mean, going back to the 1920s and 30s writing in criminology, this suggested first-generation immigrants committed less violence than second and third generation. Um, I posit that increased immigration was a factor associated with lower rates of crime. And I wrote an essay, actually. Um, this is the, pic this is the um, graph. This was in the New York Times in 2006, I think it was. Um, and there were some academic articles around it. There was a paper actually published 
before that, in 2005, Social Anatomy of Race, Ethnic Violence, where we actually just delved into all these facts and just showed this and said, look, this is just a correlation, but then went through the logic of why this could be a plausible <coughs> hypothesis. Naively, in the academic ivory tower, I thought this was a plausible, largely uncontroversial hypothesis um, until the hate mail and <laughs> started um, spewing in and, uh, well, you know, the online, the bile and all that. And so that did surprise me a bit because, again, I didn't think it was that crazy. I just said, well, this should be part of the debate. Um, but the assertions were, I can't repeat most of them, but um, <laughs> the idea was crazy. My favorite was Samson's silly theory of immigration and crime. But, um, here we are. I mean, today, in the ensuing years, immigration and crime thesis is increasingly mainstream. You know, it wasn't just me. I mean, as I said, this is an old hypothesis, really. And, you know, I was just trying to just lay it out. Um, revitalization, we're having these um, discussions. No more hate now. Um, so I think there's a lot of improvement, actually. That's a positive, you know way to think about this in terms of the intellectual debate. I mean, yes, there's still a lot of rancor out there with immigration reform, but um, it's not what it was even 10 years ago. And things quickly changed. I'm reminded of uh, like the gay marriage uh, debate. It shocked me, too, in like something like seven years or whatever, you go from this won't happen to you know complete sea change. I remember when Massachusetts, I think it was 2006, in fact, it's what we got. So anyway, a little aside on how fast norms can change. Anyway, um, mechanisms about now why the argument, a little bit on um, the data, some, some counter arguments and so forth, and then new data. So first, um, immigration is important because of the nature of who selects right, to immigrate to the United States. That's the biggest one. And it's ironic because selection bias is often the thing that is the bugbear to social scientists. We worry a lot about selection biases. But here, I mean, it's widely recognized that immigrants um, selectively migrate for the most part to the United States on characteristics that predispose them to low crimes, such as motivation to work, ambition, desire not to be deported, raise families. This is basic online, all the immigrant scholars know this. <coughs> So it's, it wouldn't be surprised then to say, well, with a selective migration flow, um, you might get a different outcome than stereotypes would lead you to. And this is undoubtedly the case. Social selection is a causal mechanism. That is, to the extent more people are predisposed to lower crime immigrant, immigrant to the United States, we now have over 40 million people of foreign born status. They will sharply increase the denominator of the crime rate while rarely appear in the numerator to get to the compositional piece. So selection favors the argument. Immigration may be causally linked to lower crime. Second, there is evidence that immigrant composition is directly related to lower crime and a number of other life outcomes. This goes back again to if if you go to the literature, the so-called Hispanic paradox or Latino paradox had been around for a while. I think people often attribute it to an article in 1986, although the, the facts were known before then. Archides and um, Correll in 1986 sort of coined that. And so the health people really were on top of this. Um, criminologists were a little slow to the slow and draw. Um, Latinos, Latinos do better on various, uh, uh, various indicators. And so, somewhat familiar with that literature, um, it motivated the exploration in that 2005 paper to try to dig between, um, really, get lines of the race ethnic differences in our Chicago data, I can get into the details of the study, um, but there were race ethnic differences, but we also had, because of the design, it was a representative population um, study, and because it was Chicago in the 1990s, we had a large immigrant population, we had lots of um, variability by first, second, and third generation. So, just briefly, um, Project for Human Development in Chicago Neighborhoods, study of, of uh, 6,000 youth followed over time, longitudinal study. Um, this has been written up. I'm just going to tell you that bottom line finding 
which I think is pretty robust, a pretty significant difference. That is to say, netting out poverty, <coughs> family structure, and all these other things, that uh, first generation parents were about 45% less likely to commit violence than second generation. And a lot of the complaints about, well, you know, they, what about the illegals? And they don't report and all that. Well, all these things were taken off the table this, in this analysis. It's a representative survey. It wasn't just based on official crime data. Illegals were, were not excluded from the sample, and so on and so forth. So there was a sort of compositional difference. Secondly, um, there was what I would call a um, contextual difference. What we found in our data was that living in concentrated immigrant neighborhoods, even at the individual level, there was contextual influence. That is to say, even if you were first or second, third generation, lower probability of violence if you were in a high immigrant neighborhood. And this is just a simple scatter plot of the relationship at the neighborhood level between immigration, in this case foreign-born diversity of the neighborhood and the violence rate. It's a predictive relationship, 2000 to the violence rate in the three years following. And what's interesting about this, going back to the kind of uh, paradox effect, is the red uh, stars, or, or I mean, uh, crosses are, are the highest poverty neighborhoods, and that's actually where it's the strongest relationship. So in other words, in the poorest neighborhoods of Chicago, immigrant concentration is related to lower uh, violence. And we also show that even at the individual level, when you control for all family and individual characteristics, and you compare um, basically two neighborhoods that are high risk on all dimensions, poverty, legal cynicism, and then you adjust for individual characteristics and look at the trajectory of violence over time, that the immigrant, first generation immigrant enclaves, if you will, are in a sense a protective uh, factor, about 25% um, lower um, violence. And why is it that there was this strong reaction, at least initially, and perhaps continues to be so? Well, one of the things I wrote about in that original essay, which was part of it, is that there's another finding out there. And that is that concentration of minority groups and immigrant groups have a powerful relationship to perceptions and to attitudes in the community about disorder and crime. And we're not the only ones to show this. And in our data, or in the book, um, I go through pretty carefully, the best I can, to take into account crime rates, but also observed disorder, for example, through videotaping. We did um, very sort of micro-level videotaping of the amount of disorder in a community, actually at a street level, 22,000 blocks in Chicago. And then we just ask people in the community how much of a problem is are these different kinds of disorder. It turns out there's huge variability within and between neighborhoods, and whites always see more, believe disorder is more of a problem than uh, blacks, Latinos, Asians, and so forth, which is interesting. But when you look at it across neighborhoods, what we find is that immigrant composition is also a predictor of increased uh, perception of disorder. And I think that's a pretty common finding, and I like this picture because it suggests that people are well aware of that stereotype, right? We are workers, not criminals. Another in um, work is in, uh, in the, the rallies in 2006 for immigration uh, reform. We are not criminals. It's a very, very uh, perceptive reaction against the stereotype. But anyway, that's important as an aside to, to understand the nature of the debate and why this is a difficult conversation. Although, as I said, it's gotten a lot better. So um, it goes against popular stereotypes, but the good news is I think they're not going away, but they're being eased a bit. So we're witnessing a scenario both similar to and different, this is my, you know, point made this morning, uh, than earlier eras of immigration from different areas of the world, as Europe in the 20th, early 20th century. Um, but um, there are some similarities. Again, even then, uh, there was the claim that immigration was you know, going to ruin America, and so on and so forth. But criminologists in the 
early part of the 20th century, even then it pointed out that the criminal propensity for first generation immigrants was, was lower. So, ironically, the uh, immigration thesis for lower crime is quintessentially American. And not even new. Although today, immigration flows are radically different in origin. Okay, that's the crime story. Um, the immigration thesis becomes more interesting, I think, when we move beyond crime proper. Many decaying inner city areas gained population in the 1990s and uh, became more vital. And um, as Jacob Victor um, has recently shown in New York, immigration is one to population growth, lower vacancy rates, and economic revitalization. This pattern is important because population loss and vacancy rates are key elements uh, undermining social order. And the pattern is seen in other cities, so for example in Chicago, where I studied, you go to um, 26th Street Corridor, a little village in the Wilson area, this is a teeming, active economic area, second only to the Magnificent Mile, which is, you know, where you get your Gucci shoes and where everyone goes, all the tourists. Um, these kinds of demographic changes are a major force, and it really suggests um, that the mechanisms uh, are really crucial and can be expanded. I've talked about the selective uh, migration mechanism, which is simple but powerful. Um, another one which I didn't mention, I don't really have time to get into, in our data too, which again is ironic, if you think about the critiques of immigration often on the right, that family structure, for example, impact families and religious participation are much higher. Um, than the general population that most of the population is globally, but that's side count. Um, economic renewal of poor areas, uh, which I'm starting to talk about now, business entrepreneurship, self-employment, physical renewal, uh, reduction of vacancies, uh, population <coughs> growth, um, and densities. So um, I'm beginning to, to think about all this and expand it more and bring the crime story into line with this other kind of research. And what's important about that, I think, or what's at least interesting to me intellectually, is that the link between crime and things like vacancy and growth and density are just so tight. I mean, think about the broken windows thesis, for example, right? It's all about things like the physical structure and, and vacancies as a signal of the decline of an area. So to the extent that immigration and business renewal in part filling up uh, formerly abandoned neighborhoods and houses, you know, click. That's a, an important mechanism that starts to tie these literatures together. It also suggests that there are really important implications for assessing the crime hypothesis, right? So in other words, if these things are going on, then a lot of what criminologists do might not be the right kind of analysis, like if you're adjusting for things like economic revitalization, right, holding constant, these things to assess the role of immigration and crime, you may be, it's a technical point, but it's substance, you may be adjusting out the very pathways through which the effect is happening, right? So um, that, that's important because what you control uh, will determine your conclusion. So bottom line, to the extent that immigration is causally bound up with major social changes, processes of spatial diffusion that are in turn part of the explanatory process of reduced crime, estimating only the direct effects of immigration will give us the wrong answer. Now, this has been recognized, and there's good studies that have been done, and um, there's also some new evidence that I'd, that I'd like to talk about. So, if you go up to about 2009, so I wrote that and I published this paper in context 2008. So I've been trying to get a handle on the literature since then for this uh, and so forth. And it's really been this, like, well, I call it a mini explosion. There's still not a lot. There's actually some, some really good work. And um, what I want to focus in on is the, the change analysis. So much of the data at the macro level is correlational or cross-sectional, yet there's recent evidence that examining changes in crime and changes in immigration um, can give us some new uh, insight and changes in immigration and changes in some of these other factors. So, um, this is probably not easy to read, but well, in my book, I, had, uh, I have a chapter that 
pushes the immigration thesis a little bit further along this line of looking at changes in immigration and changes in crime. Now, I'm not going to get technical on you, um, but one of the things about a change analysis when you have in, uh, neighborhoods is you can do a kind of within neighborhood or fixed effects kind of analysis, which allows you to adjust for a lot of the critiques about the stable, unique characteristics of, of a neighborhood that might be explaining that cross-sectional difference. So we can get rid of that, if you will, and look at um, change on change. And then, I'm sure there's more. Probably some of you here in the audience will say, my pick was not up there. <laughs> this is not exhausted, it's represented, but um, these are all papers that have been published in the last uh, few years. Um, I also put uh, Sam's paper here, too. Uh, yeah. Immigrant violent crime rates in the U.S. change analysis, Stoll's analysis, um, all this across the United States, cool cross-sectional time series analysis, John McDonald's work with HIP on changes in uh, crime rates um, in Los Angeles, paper used in rainfall as an instrumental variable analysis. Um, you know, so a lot of really interesting work. So again, the, the research is um, improving. Now, what's the well, what are the findings? Well, I think, well, first of all, the work that I did, this is adapted from the book, um, does show that changes in immigration, and I also looked at it because I felt like sometimes just the born born um, doesn't necessarily get the idea of the sort of multicultural and the penetration of real um, change. So uh, we looked at um, language diversity. And um, I might get details here, but I think uh, the census you can get something like uh, 25 or more languages that are spoken, and we calculated Herfindahl index. So those are interesting uh, details, which is just an index of diversity that um, really gets at uh, how many different languages relative to the population are spoken. And we also conducted a spatial heterogeneity model. We wanted to see what, are there certain areas in the city that sort of have greater effects. And what you see here is basically the message is the darkest areas, like this little swap here and this swap here, are basically significant um, negative relationships, that is the moral language diversity, the lower the homicide rate. And the near north side is the higher income um, areas of Chicago, relatively almost changing white, um, does not have the same sort of effect, and I talk about why that might be the case. But bottom line, Increases immigration, lower crime. Now, of those papers that I put up there, I think it's fair to say that the net result is either a null effect, like the rainfall one, um, didn't find any relationship, and um, others find a significant negative effect, that is, increases immigration, reduction of crime. So, overall, then, I think you can conclude that it's either not um, problematic regard to the social fabric of our country, or salubrious with regard to lower crime. So that's how, oops, that's how I read the literature. Furthermore, other recent stuff. Um, for an issue on immigration of the annals, which is a pen um, product, uh, John Dowell and I uh, commissioned papers on this specific issue. Again, same findings. Scholars who participated were in agreement that while new immigrants are poorer than the general population and face considerable hardship, there's no evidence that they have reshaped the social fabric in that in harmful ways. Um, integrating the annals volume and independent recent papers, I, I thus conclude, as I'm saying that, I think it's uh, you know on balance um, related to lower crime. And then, there's this issue of going beyond crime. I'm going to plug Jacob's <laughs> report. We were on a panel, was it two weeks ago? America's Society, I didn't know too much about this, but they um, had this really interesting thing. Immigration here is the contribution of foreign born Americans in the New York Renaissance. I take a look at Jacob's paper, so it's short. Um, but he marches through and looks at crime, vacancy, business and so forth, and consistent here. Um, precincts in New York that saw the greatest increases in immigration, uh, low, uh, had the greatest reductions in crime. But what really struck me, and 
again, I'm, that's why I'm trying to push this more now, is this idea of the vacancy in population. Because it's true, the neighborhoods that were hollowed out, and the, where we're stopped, in the Bronx, and Brooklyn, the big immigration flows are not going to the Upper East Side, right? <laughs> Manhattan, and you know, where people talk about gentrification. Corresponding area of the Bronx, areas of Queens, which now Queens is what, 50%? More and more. I mean, think of that, it's incredible. Um, Brooklyn, high density, it's kind of like Jane Jacobs, you know, coming back to life in a way, um, with the density of street activity and reduction of eight units. And that just, I think, is so crucially important. So, um, as part of this paper, and motivated by this literature, and thinking about the connection between the crime literature and this literature vis-a-vis -vis the mechanism of vacancies, um, I've done two things. I'm only going to talk about one here uh, because, so it's a 145, right? Um, the Chicago Project, which I um, talk about in the book a lot, um, I'm doing some follow-up work on first, second, third generation. We just completed a new study and um, have some uh, work on long-term patterns of immigrant differences. But secondly, on a more macro level basis, what I want to end with is some new data, is that I've looked now, and part of this is in collaboration with a graduate student um, who is doing a dissertation on immigration and um, revitalization in cities. She's got an article coming on the ASR and August look for her on the market. <laughs> you got to plug your students, check it on. Um, in the census data for the U.S. and key cities focusing on population growth and vacancy rates. And I just want to show you a few key things here. I'm not going to get into all the details, but um, I think it's pretty interesting. So this is, these are every, this is every single neighborhood, if you will, that measured as a census tract in the United States. It's the first thing we had to do is we, we got the boundaries. A matched up from 1990 to 2010, so the 2008 to 2012 American Community Survey is the latest survey you get, so the model year, middle years, 2010. And have a, a, an array of characteristics in terms of housing structure, homeowners, racial composition, percent black, um, percent college change, is a pretty decent indicator of class compositional change in, in gentrification and poverty. And what this is looking at now, again, think about that fixed effect argument, this is purely a change on change analysis. It's looking at change in the vacancy rate over the uh, decade of the 2000-2010, and change in poverty, competition, and immigration. What you see is, first of all, not surprisingly, increases in poverty, and um, vacancy go hand in hand, and the, the uh, sort of college prices um, down, but immigration is significant. And it's basically rivaling, these are all coefficients, because these are all in um, the same metric, in terms of the change in immigration linked to about a four point, about three and a half point uh, difference defined in the rate of vacancy. So this is very consistent with the idea that one of the mechanisms whereby we may be getting these changes through the reduction of vacancy rate. Um, by the way, I'm not going to show it, but with population growth, same thing happens. Now you might say, well, that's, we're talking about metropolitan revitalization. This is all the U.S. Well, the reason I started with this is I thought, well, it's kind of interesting to try everything. That is, it's not selecting, not anywhere. It's the entire country that goes to the argument made earlier, again, is that St. James, Minnesota, rural areas, it's not just the metropolitan areas that are seeing increases in immigration. But let's go to the big three. As you know, LA, New York, and Chicago. So I selected out um, New York City, Cook County, which includes Chicago. I haven't done just the city border yet because of the of Chicago in that area, and then Los Angeles County. It's about 50, yeah, about 5,000 tracks. But there's a lot of people now, because these are three large cities. It's like 23, 4 million people, I think, something like that, the exact figure. So this is, this is like metropolitan USA, right? And not surprisingly, these are just dummy variables for LA and New York. You see the cranes, right? So the vacancy rates, compared to Chicago anyway, uh, decline. But um, notice that 
the same, well, two, only two things change. First of all, percent black. There's a racial dimension going on in the big three that's not going on in the country as a whole, which is interesting. I won't get into that. But the immigration effect, um, it's in fact, but again, this is change on change analysis, is there, it's actually a little bit larger, four point differential. And then finally, um, I was also interested in the full picture of the trajectory, right? Because if you think about it in kind of life course dynamics at the macro level, you get neighborhoods that get on a, a trajectory of change. And you could argue that there could be some uh, you know, reciprocality here because we're looking at changes in immigration and changes in vacancy rate. Right? So um, the last analysis I did was to look at the trajectory of the 90s when you saw the greatest increases in immigration in these three places and the concurrent uh, pathway of immigration. Lo and behold, um, the trajectory of immigration increase in the 90s predicts the vacancy rate uh, decline, as does the concurrent. So it's almost like it's setting on a path, it's kind of almost a path dependency kind of thing here. And the magnitude is actually uh, only slightly less than the change in immigration. Again, we have all these other controls for uh, other changes. Remember, all fixed characteristics are uh, accounted for in this particular analysis. Okay. Um, I had some stuff I could show you on the, the Chicago uh, data, but I want to stick to the macro level. And I've talked about crime, I've talked about vacancies, and again, this holds for more or less for population. So what I'm saying is I think there's this broad um, picture emerging. So let me conclude. Cass has recently argued that the explosion of immigration in the United States has, quote, irrevocably smashed the black-white frame, end quote. I reviewed his book, which is why uh, that just jumped out at me. It's a provocative assertion that runs up against the enduring legacy of racial inequality. But it's true that the nation has changed in profound ways that have transformed the old racial order of the city. If I'm right on the evidence, these rapid changes in immigration have had net positive effects on a wide swath of urban life. But, and this came up today too, I think we have to be careful, not all of the changes are necessarily positive, and immigration is a work in progress. Residents perceive more disorder when there are more immigrants, and they just can't deny this. And um, Putnam, for example, Robert Putnam, has provided sobering evidence that neighbors are less trusting the more diverse the neighborhood is. Even if you are, they're the same race or immigrant status, that is, he's arguing that diversity itself is undermining of trust. And that finding people don't like it, um, but it's been replicated and it's robust. At the international level, there's also evidence by economists, the changes in welfare provisions tend to decline as societies become more diverse. And we have seen an increase in social division, as you know, um, the Netherlands, France, and other European countries as a result of immigration and diversity, right? Things do not look so pretty over there, and in many ways we may be uh, have occurred. So these findings are caution. I'm not giving you a Pollyannish view here that the trajectory will always be smooth. It depends on the context. Substantial population change is also turning cities inside out and calling into question traditional urban and criminological models. The city roller coaster continues. For example, unlike the recent past, poverty is increasingly concentrated in the suburbs, wealth is concentrating in the center cities, and gentrification is reshaping many formerly working class and poor areas. US cities are, in essence, becoming like European cities, at least some US cities, not Detroit. Um, Alan Ehrenhoff has called this process the great inversion. I don't quite agree with that term. I think demographic revision is more accurate. But in any case, we need to retire the notion of the inner city and consider the many implications of the change in diversity for the crime and urban change. So in sum, cities and neighborhoods are rapidly changing with respect to diversity and immigration. The increasing presence of global neighborhoods, as Logan and John put it, opens up a new set of challenges along with unsolved problems of race and inequality that have long plagued American cities and criminal justice in America. Still, on balance, the evidence suggests that immigration has yielded a net good and is responsible, at least in part, for the remarkable turnaround of the American metropolis.
think I'll take some, we'll take some questions uh, for a, a, a couple of minutes because it's such a provocative talk. I do have a favor to ask since we're already a little bit over time, which is keep your questions to one question, not, not multi-part questions and not statements so that Rob can uh, respond uh, um, as, um, as expeditiously as possible. We'll, uh, we'll start this way and move this way. Uh, so we'll start over here. Uh, I'd just like to ask about the, the reporting of race in crime, in crime statistics, because I happen to deal in crime. And uh, I noticed that some of my defendants are classified uh, depending on what the police officer believes. Sometimes they're classified as white, then later they're classified as Hispanic, and then later they're classified as black. And this is a problem. So how do you deal with that as a researcher when I race is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go around? Yeah, no, we'll start. We can answer each other. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, for official data, this has been a problem, particularly because, well, two things. The census changed how they report race and span over time, and then the police um, changed their reporting too. So it's hard over time. Although, um, in the past, uh, since the point of the crime decline is less of a problem, and yes, there's misclassification, um, but I don't think the broad patterns um, that's enough to undermine that. Um, secondly, for example, the data that um, I presented from Chicago um, aren't based on those data at all. They're not based on official, they're based on interviews with people and both self-reported racial classification and interview or uh, based observation and uh, sort of validation too. So that, that's sort of off the table on those. But you're right, I mean, in terms of um, the, the classification. But I think, um, you know, if you look at some of the broad patterns, like, for example, just looking at the relationship between um, foreign-born immigration and crime rate, none of the crime rate figures are actually broken down by the type of, of offense. In other words, so that's not part of it either, right? In other words, just the overall crime rate, not the crime rate of, for example, um, a particular group. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this and for your years of great work. Um, question that uh, I've often had reading your work: you, you you place this really important emphasis on perception as this this uh, you know variable that that shapes. Uh, I think of your critique of broken windows theory, for instance. I wonder, could you speak a little bit more about perceptions, about why they matter, about where they come from, which is one thing I don't see a, a ton of in your work necessarily, and then also maybe for a, from a sort of public policy or intervention perspective, what can we do about the enduring impacts of these perceptions moving forward? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Um, I'm. Um, I leave this semester with a, a Jerry Kahn. Scholar, of course, on implicit bias, mm -hmm. we've been having these long conversations. The problem is a lot of these are very deep and long-lasting um, perceptions. Yes, they are. I think they are very important. Um, one of the things that we tried to do in the work was to step back and say, where do these perceptions come from? In other words, the whole disorder, just real quickly, what bothered me about the broken windows debate is that it had been sort of had to be problematized. Well, what, do, what do we mean by disorder? Mm -hmm. When I teach this, you know, you put up, I put up a picture, actually, in my book of you know, the scene. I say, I ask students, is this disorder? And then they go off, you know, half of them say yes, and I say no, no. That's, that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to systematically uncover that. And in fact, that's how you find out that there are deep racial and weird concentration differences. We say, where do they come from? And that, I argue the book is in part um, linked to the legacies of racial inequality. And, and it's not like that comes out of the blue. I mean, people aren't crazy. Yeah. With disorder, it is true that, and crime, that disorder is higher um, historically in disinvested communities, which tend to be poor, and uh, racial minorities dominate. So, um, but that may not describe any one community, so that's how you get both a structural reality. So, bottom line is when I say that you know, perception is important, it's not perception is devoid of context. It's the rooted in context and they take on a life of their own. Um, but hopefully they're changing. But yeah, it's, it's an important question to, to thrive in value research, and particularly in the whole implicit bias literature. What's bothered me about that literature is it tends to just focus in on, you know, what's in people's 
heads. <laughs> and it's almost like the uh, the solution is to change the brain. <laughs> and I, I don't go down that road. <laughs> what gets in your brain is uh, what's in the world. Does perce perception change reality? Right. <laughs> right. No. Um, I had, I wanted to follow it. I'm not going to bring culture up here, but to what extent did you find that language difference in Chicago had a great effect? Because I remember Eric Kleinberg heat wave book where, in fact, the Mexican neighborhoods had a protective effect because people hung out uh, in the street, looked after one another, stayed in, well, I mean, even the barber shop, if that's even if that is yeah. the case. And isn't that perceived as disorder? Mine is the same way. That the fact that people are out in the street is perceived as disorder by suburban populations. Yes, absolutely. And it, you're right. I mean, if you take Eric's analysis, but it also connects to the discussion here today about vacancies, right? And that's why I mentioned Jacob. Jacob. So, in other words, the idea of people on the stoops and I mean, you have a beer and that brown bag, and, um, kids, a little disorderly, um, low vacancy rate stores, vibrancy. Um, his argument was that because you had that kind of ecology, and there was an article, but by the way, using Chicago data uh, on a more systematic basis, using the videotapes um, that showed that, in fact, the heat wave deaths were lower in the neighborhoods that had that ecology. And you're right, I mean, that is a healthy, vibrant area that was related to better outcomes, even though it is was maybe per perceived as more um, disorder. But again, I think things are changing. Like the whole life, if you look, I mean, just look at the demand side now, the whole suburban, you know, scene and where there is nothing going on is, I mean, it's not a flood gate, but there's, a, there's an exodus, I think, from that and a demand for this um, return. And by the way, it's linked to crime, because I do think that, I mean, the decline of cities was inextricably linked to the violence. And once you have a lower rate of violence and a perceived uh, viability and civility in cities, then you're going to see what's happening, which is a floodgate of people wanting to live there, not to live in Winnetka. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks so much for your, your presentation. It's really great. Um, I was wondering, you had mentioned um, that in first generation in different neighborhoods, that religion sometimes is, is a factor. Uh, to, to show that crime has gone down, stability, family, and so on. Um, but I wondered if you had also looked at uh, religious diversity or pluralism and, and densely populated in other neighborhoods as well. Is that had an effect? I've done research on Flushing Queens and yeah. really remarkable <coughs> place. But there's other other uh, work out there. It's Omar Ben Roberts and Kate yeah. Day uh, who, who've looked at. And usually, religious institutions are seen as tax exempt and don't really generate revenue for the neighbor and so on, but there are tangible and, and sometimes tangible benefits to the neighborhood as well. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I'd say that I really didn't look at religion, especially vis a vis the immigration question. There is a section in the book, um, and I'm familiar with Homer's work, I like a lot on religious ecology. Um, the only thing I can say is that the picture that comes out of Chicago, anyway, is that you, you have a dense religious ecology often in neighborhoods that are um, devastated. And um, in fact, if you look within the black community, the areas that have highest density of churches are, have low trust. This kind of goes the opposite of what you might expect in terms of civic life. And I think there's a historical reason for that, which I don't have time to get into, but it kind of just goes against what you might think of. Um, but that's in the black community, not the American. So I don't really know the immigrant community religion story. I think we have time for maybe two more, um, uh, and then uh, well, three. We'll do three more, and then maybe I'll ask a question about that. <laughs> a little bit more of a piggyback of what was going on in terms of best practices. What you've discovered in terms of the communities that you've looked at, what could we be doing to be helping those? you know, immigrant communities to establish their social networks and do the things they need to do to use that as a theater and kind of grow out of it and, you know, still be happy or perceived to be, you know, right. Best practices, really. Is the yeah, best practices. Well, I'm going to have to give that uh, academic guy your tower and answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> I don't mean that. I think it's incredibly important 
It's just that, um, yeah, I don't know. How did you Other than just getting the information? Did you have to do that granularly? Did you go into the community? Yeah, yeah, we spent a lot of time on the ground. I guess my answer is That's how not to be sufficient. <laughs> it, it is that I think get, just getting information out there. The right. smell I think is the key. I mean, Walking. it's sort of throughout the day. I mean, I think just getting this kind of information um, out there is the best thing that we can do. I mean, I don't know about a specific policy, but I think um, well, that, I was, that's how I was it. really thinking, based on what you've seen in those communities, yeah. what do you think would help them to, to be successful in what they're already doing, basically? Right. Yeah, I have to think about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, cool. it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, the policy question is always. Andrew, I should make it, I'm going to build my question into my talk and yield my time to you, but the, it's going to be about, has anyone looked at the built environment? But I'll do that later. Yes? I, Sarah, I wonder if you, if you could um, if you could also add to the factors that, that contributed to the decline of the crime, those three factors. Uh, first one, the war on terror, when, when they had Homeland Security and stuff, they were not just catching terrorists, they were also catching criminals who were, were coming to the United States. Mm -hmm. so, and, and they were also, uh, they were also legalizing whoever signed up for uh, on the war on terror. The second, the second factor is legalizing uh, drug, and the, the drug dealer are, are, are hoping for more. The third factor, and please just. Uh, Back in, the, back in the days, the Italian and, and the Italian and the Irish they used to commit crime to build seed mining. So I wonder if the current, uh, once, they, once they develop that seed money, they didn't they stop committing crimes anymore. I wonder if you think the same thing happening with the current wave of Mexican immigrants. Once they develop seed money, they don't have to steal cars or selling drugs anymore. Yeah. Um. Well, just real quickly, um, the terror uh, hypothesis, I think, can't explain it if you just look at the, the trend, because the decline happened well before um, the, the, the changes. I mean, it started about 1993, uh, four. So in other words, the trajectory was well set. Um, that was Clinton. That's, that was Clinton's initiative about fighting crime. It was policing community. That was Clinton initiative for fighting crime. But, it, but, but, but the decline was slight. The, client, the, the decline went so deep after push. After uh, push were terror. Well, I would disagree with that. Um, uh, yeah, it was very, it was very sharp. I mean, I, you can see the line there, and there's, there's really not uh, uh, much of a difference. In fact, uh, there's a little bit of a leveling off that happened around 2000. Three to five, and then, get, and then it went down more. So it doesn't match up. Um, yeah. <coughs> the last question. I mean, you know, it goes in. I guess you go back to the old literature on, um, you know, gangs and, and, and corruption and so forth, and, and the, how money um, flows or not in communities. I haven't really studied that. Um, I mean, there's people that look at remittance flows as well, that, uh, which I don't think we know much about um, in terms of how it relates to to the crime crime. But I don't, yeah, I don't think about how that would uh, that would fit in. What was your second one? The oh, my second one, oh, I forgot my second. <laughs> oh, you guys did drugs, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean. It, I really have. I mean, it's only been legalized in a few places lately, and um, I don't know. It's crime down in Colorado. It um, is. Twenty-five million dollars later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, and it, it co costs less than house yeah, I think criminals. I think the jury's out now. I mean, people, don't forget. This is. You know, Kurt Schmoke tried to do this in Baltimore years ago, and got run out of town. Again, this is how things change. Now this is happening, and, and now you can go apply to it. By pot, so things change. So what we're going to know, because um, we have good experiments now, and the, the timing of it in the different states, such as that we can estimate causal effect. The problem is the crime is already so down that I'm not sure how it is. <laughs> 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 <laughs>